pulling back up on Earnhardt. Comes Derek Cope in that red Chevrolet number 10. And the car number one of Terry Labonte right in there running in the third position. Derek Cope has never finished better than sixth place in any of his racing starts. This will be his first top five finish. And look at him putting the pressure on Earnhardt. Ha, huh, it looks like that run that Rutman made a few years ago in Lake Speed. Coming down to Dale Earnhardt. One lap to go. Does anybody have anything left? Dale Earnhardt. Here comes Do Cope down on the inside. Oh, Earnhardt has Earnhardt problems. slopping back. Something is amiss. Here comes the field driving for the finish. And on the outside, it is car number 10, Derek Cope. Something amiss on the Earnhardt car. Coming to the line. It's Labonte pulling up. And an amazing finish. The Whitcomb Racing Team has won it. Unbelievable. Earnhardt had a tire go down maybe as he went into the turn. And Nicole crying a little bit. Brett mm. Cope's first top five finish, his first victory, comes in the Daytona 500. A remarkable day of sport. Unbelievable. Bob Whipcomb, who brought a team out three years ago, had nothing but misfortune and bad luck. And Rick Hendrick, who gave a car to one driver today to be in this race, literally gave it to him just, just to Strickland. get him out of here. Hot Strickland, after uh, he was involved in altercation, now he's put some motors together for this team, and they've won the biggest race of all. The man you see here in victory lane is Derek Cope. The man he passed back there? That's Dale Earnhardt. One would go on to be a seven-time champion, the other not. One would become a household name, the other an underdog fella who we recall from a fluke. One became legend, the other curiosity. It's the classic case of a one-hit wonder. We see it in forms of media like music, but we see it in sports too. In the case of NASCAR, Ron Bouchard, modified track champ, would go on to make one of the biggest upset victories in the sports history in 1981. Yet today, we only recall him for his passes on the outside at places like Stafford. So what about Derek here? You don't end up running in the front of the Daytona 500 by accident. And hell, he beat Earnhardt to the punch by at least eight years. And while it may have been a part of his most stable season, this win at Daytona didn't materialize into further success. Where the hell did he come from anyway? This is the story of a one-hit wonder. This is the story of Derek Cope. Derek Cope was born on November 3rd, 1958. Before he ever saw the racetrack, he was a regular on baseball fields. He'd managed to prove himself a very solid catcher and moved up to college baseball. So good was he that talent scouts on the Chicago Cubs and Baltimore Orioles regularly showed up to games, keen on potentially recruiting him. That all very quickly vanished when he ended up with a knee injury in the form of a torn meniscus and other adjacent ligaments. Some believe that this was his only sporting background and that he hadn't been familiar with racing at all, but this actually couldn't be further from the truth. His father, Don, had actually participated in drag racing, especially through the 70s and 80s. Derek here actually helped grind camshafts in the race shop and generally assisted putting motors together. It may not have been his first and foremost ambition in life, but whether he knew it or not, he'd been preparing himself for a faster future. His other siblings would also follow adjacent career paths, such as his cousin Ernie, who would find his place in NASCAR by becoming the competition director for JTG Daughtery. His brother Darren would also try to pay his dues as a driver as well. He'd step into a stock car for the first time in 1981, driving for Jefferson Racing in the ARCA series and was already showing incredible promise, gained the pole position in his first ever start at Portland Speedway. Especially impressive was this, given he'd never actually done this before. While he couldn't manage a flag-to-flag -flag run, and didn't even manage to lead a lap, he nonetheless finished a very respectable sixth that day. Unfortunately, to put it lightly, the rest of the season did not go anywhere near as smoothly. Brake failures, Broken valve springs, and other assorted engine analogies had ensured he'd never make it to the end, failing to finish his remaining three starts that he'd committed to. 1982 would see him continue his ARCA stint, but also his first ever Cup Series start, driving.
trying to find his way through the twisty S's of California Riverside. Tim Richmond would go on to win and prove the beginning of his road course success, and Derek unfortunately wouldn't finish better than 36th that day. On the ARCA side of things in 1983, a very consistent effort was shown, three top fives and top tens. An even better showing in 1984 in his first full ARCA season, with two wins, six top fives, and eight top tens. Unfortunately, it'd only be good enough to be a runner-up in the championship, being just short of nabbing the title, but as you can imagine, he'd win the Rookie of the Year honors without much trouble. He was learning, and learning fast. His three cup series starts that year didn't amount to much of anything. Something that would be a trend for the next few years. But that was the Cup Series. It's a pretty big leap from older Ford and Chevy bodies scooting around on short tracks. Now would probably be a very good time to answer a question you're probably thinking about right now. He never ran a Bush car? And yes, that's right. He only ever ran Arca and found himself a Cup Series ride somehow. Typically, most would get a ride via showing their merits in the Bush Series first. It would seem that team owners just believed that he had enough of a knack for a Cup Series ride. Which may be somewhat true, but at least at this point, he was only 60% of the way there. He still needed more time to grow and learn, as would be true for just about any driver. Speaking of growing and learning, 1985 saw him nab another win in the series, this time at Washington's Evergreen Speedway. Alongside with that were three top fives and three top tens to boot, as well as yet another pole position start. This would be his last full-time ARCA ride in the series, at least in ARCA West. That same year as well, he won three races in the ARCA Northwest series, with two poles, four top fives, and five top tens. Solid effort, for sure. But unfortunately, it only led up fifth on the overall final point standings, and he wouldn't win any races in 1986, but he would get not one, not two, but three pole position starts. And, is as almost tradition at this point, you guessed it, three top fives and three top tens to show for it. Until his final start in 1990, he wouldn't manage anything better than a few top fives and top tens here and there, and overall no better than 19th in most point standings. Now you probably noticed I didn't mention anything for the latter half of the 80s as far as his cup career went, and that's not because he didn't race. He was there, but frankly there wasn't an awful lot to write home about there at all. However, I would be remiss if I ignored some of the efforts. In his first ever Winston All-Star race, driving for Fred Stoke in the number 19 Ford Thunderbird, he started 8th, and probably would have stayed there or finished better had the engine not gone bang. And for next year, he started 4th and finished 5th, driving for Tim Testa, and earning a cool 12 grand to show for his hard work. A prelude for what was to come. 1990s, where the Derek that we come to know and remember comes into the fold. During the off-season, Derek would sign with Bob Whitcomb to drive the number 10 Pure Later Filters Chevrolet Lumina. Bob's team was a fresh upstart, having only entered the Cup Series in 1988. They were looking for some success, and even came somewhat close, with Ken Bouchard, Ron Bouchard's brother, in 1987 and 88, both in the Bush and Cup Series respectively. But it wouldn't materialize more than a few top 10s. Bob looked at Derek's resume and saw incredible potential. Derek would team up with crew chief Buddy Parrott, with credentials easily worthy of the Hall of Fame, in 1989, helping him land four top tens. It seemed to get adjusted well enough, though Buddy was a very shrewd crew chief, which is to say, he set up the car and you adjusted to it, not the other way around. If you said it was wrecking loose, well, too bad. You're getting your spoiler knocked down an extra two inches for that. Get used to it and ride the banking more. With just enough of a budget to buy engines, but not enough to have an engine shop of their own, the number 10 team will rely on Hendrick Motorsports as their engine supplier. As is tradition, the qualifying for Daytona is decided via speed weeks. Things would go off initially without a hitch, but without much of the pace that they needed, starting only 19th. But by the end of the race, they'd nab 6th in their qualifying stint. The stage was set, and it was time for one of the lowest funded race teams to try and put on a show. This was a big deal for Bill in particular as, just a year prior, they'd actually gone broke. To do well here would mean the world to him, and ensure some sort of a future for the team. A lot was riding on this. Ken Schrader would be that day's pole sitter, sitting pretty in the white and green number 25 Chevy Lumina for Rick Hendrick. 
but he would have to fall back in the field for the start. It was also a filming day for the upcoming film Days of Thunder. The two camera cars would start at the back of the field. The number 18 Hardy's car, driven by two-time Bush Series champ Tommy Ellis, and the now iconic number 51 Mellow Yellow Chevrolet, driven by Bobby Hamilton. They would go the distance of only 100 miles before leaving the track and hand their camera tapes over to Tony Scott. Tom Cruise would not be the story of the day, and the events that were about to unfold would be equally fit for cinema. Jeff Bodine, in the number 11, would lead the first lap, but in Earnhardt's typical commandeering fashion, would lead after that. 53 laps later, Ken Schrader would go from the back of the pack to fifth, mingling with the leaders. Bill Elliott, 1985 and 1987 Daytona 500 champ, would follow right behind the Intimidator, with Bodine falling back to third. Waiting in the reins was Derek, running strong in fourth, holding steady as he can. A tire failure on Richard Petty's Pontiac would cause him to self-spin, and brought out a much-needed caution for drivers like Darrell Waltrip, who was facing vibration issues in the tide ride. All the leaders would pit for tires and fuel. Derek Cope leaves pit road inheriting 10th, Ken Schrader's charge to the front will be paused for now, and any forward progress was nullified by a slow pit stop due to a stubborn lug nut on the left rear tire. He will restart 15th. Jimmy Spencer and the number 57 Heinz Pontiac will lead them after only taking right side tires in the pit cycle. As a consequence though, Mr. Excitement wouldn't hold the lead long, however, as the black number 3 hovers into view and passes him on the inside. Derek Cope would begin to make up his deficit from 10th spot to 7th, with Schrader passing him from 15th to 6th spot, and then 3rd passing Mark Martin. Second caution will be called by Phil Parsons taking out Bush champ and Cup Series rookie Robbie Moroso, Alan Kowicki, and Mike Alexander who was driving the number 12 driving for Bobby Allison. Kowicki would drive away mostly unscathed, and the other three cars would be junked for the day. Richard Petty would take advantage of the situation, gaining two laps back under caution by not pitting. Schrader would still face slower pit cycles. For instance, in the case of the Childress crew, fuel and four tires only took them 24 seconds. For the 25 team, with the exact same procedure, 31 seconds. Alan Kowicki would opt to swap tires, but only to help the roll of the car easier behind the wall. A torn oil line will require additional work before he can get back out, and he will assist with the repairs. Also behind the wall go the Days of Thunder camera cars. Davey Allison in the cycle knocked the toe out of his car when trying to pit. The number 28 team will take a closer look and attempt repairs during the latter half of caution laps. He wouldn't end up losing a lap. Derek wouldn't take tires, and neither would Mark Martin, opting instead to take fuel in order to gain valuable track position. Jack Pennington on number 47 would lead them on the restart, his third ever Cup Series start, followed by Mark Martin and Derek Cope. Jack would eventually lose the spot, moving over for Mark Martin. On to the tri-oval, and with Earnhardt behind him, Derek would inherit the lead from Mark, leading lap 54, being the first lap he ever led in the great American race. It is worth pointing out that just last year, that team failed to even qualify to make it into the field. And now, not only were they in the field, but they were leading it. He would eventually get passed again by the black number 3, but he would stay strong running behind him despite older tires. The number 25 of Ken Schrader would puff smoke out the back, and he would have to go behind the wall. The Kodiak Lumina freight train running out of steam altogether, leaving the only Hendrick motor in contention to win, being the number 10 car. 75 laps later, and still no shine of Schrader. 79 laps later, and whilst Dale dominates, the field begins to splinter. Jack Pennington went from leading a few laps to fighting 28th, and then pit road. Bill Elliott reports oil on the windscreen, potentially putting him out of the running. Jeff Bodine leads the second pack, but as he begins to move up, Derek would pass him on the inside line. Rick Wilson will retain third behind Bodine, as his Oldsmobile is too loose to follow. After 200 miles and with no caution in sight, Earnhardt is the first to go through with a green flag stop. Derek Cope not far behind him. Dale will take fuel and right side tires. Buddy Parrott, meanwhile, asks Derek to stay out another lap, meaning Bill Elliott will come in before him on pit road. But the number 10 team will then be able to take just right sides and fuel, just enough to offset the inexperienced pit crew's pit times. Davey Allison no longer faces any issues with his car, and begins to lead ahead of Jeff Bodine, but he will have to come in for scheduled pit stops, alongside others like Mark Martin. Bobby Hillen will finally get his chance to pit, and with the quick wits of crew chief Harry Hyde, have him swapping right sides and grabbing fuel before heading back out. Davey Allison will return to pit road, looking over the car again, and taking the opportunity to also swap left side tires on that unscheduled stop. 
Alan Kowicki can be seen back on track, but multiple laps down. Harry Gantz will only manage to lead one lap at the proceedings, but it was the lap that mattered, at least for him. He will collect the halfway money bonus. Earnhardt once again leads, and meanwhile AJ Foyt goes behind the wall, citing health concerns. Derek is now in the fight for second place, with Dale 10 seconds ahead in the lead. After 275 miles, fuel strategy becomes even more paramount. Rumblings and discussions in the Roush pit for Mark Martin about making the distance on the end on possibly just two fuel stops. Only 21 cars remain the lead lap. The interval between Derek and Dale now becomes 12 seconds. Mark Martin too is no longer the lead lap due to a green flag stop. 20 cars now only remain in the lead lap fight. Dale has now led 100 laps, but will have to pit. Once again, Derek not far behind. Dale will take four tires and fuel, but Derek's strategy is once again two tires and fuel. Dale will have to pit again to make the distance. Ricky Rudd and Jeff Bodine battle for the lead, Ricky taking it through the tri-oval, and both will be preparing to pit for fuel and rubber. The number five team swapped left sides to fix the tire stagger. Bill Elliott will do the same. Terry Labonte would almost cause a caution, doing a high-speed drifting exercise. Despite the extra right rear tire heat, will remain on track for now. Jeff Bodine behind him will come down for pit road to swap tires, and likely new pants as well. 142 laps completed, and now the final dice rolls must be played out. Terry Labonte will take four tires and fuel after staying out. Mark Martin needs his car checked out and some more liquids on the hot day. The Harry Hyde strategy would pay off for Bobby Hillen at least for the time being. We now begun to lead the field, with Earnhardt and Derek Cope behind him in second and third respectively. He will come in again, but they can rest easy knowing that they will have enough fuel to make the distance. Four tires is all that's needed. Mark Martin's car is currently dragging on the header, and will now have to add more trouble on top of the overly loose condition. His day might be over. 375 miles later, and Earnhardt once again commands. 13 lead chains wouldn't be enough to dethrone Mr. Restrictor Plate. At lap 150, a roadblock appears in the form of 49 years young, 1989 Rookie of the Year, Dick Trickle. The 1200 race feature winning White Knight, proving to be a foil for the black number 3. This was also true in the earlier 125 races prior to the 500. Dale would now enjoy a 17 second advantage over Derek, but they wouldn't have that luxury for long. One more stop would have to be fulfilled in order to make the race distance. 198 miles later, Earnhardt continues to fall behind Dick Trickle, before eventually making his move after 10 laps. The White Knight falls off the lead lap, and now only 11 lead lap drivers now remain, the last being Neil Bonnet. In the meanwhile, Rusty Wallace, the number 27, is so far having the best ever Daytona 500 run, being just behind Bill Elliott in 6th. With his average finish being so far of 21st, he and the team are hoping to at least get a top 5, or maybe better. Dale, meanwhile, now enjoys a very comfortable 27 second lead. To quote Dave Despain, only a sniper is about all that can stop them. They will end up coming down pit road before they can manage to lap Rusty Wallace. Had he done so, only 5 lead lap cars would have remained. An 8.2 second stop for full fuel, briefly losing the lead to Derek. Ricky Rudd enjoys the fastest pit stop of the Hendrick camp, the number 5 car only taking right side tires. Dale will retake the lead, with Derek still needing to pit. However, a savvy pit call from Buddy Parrott has the crew top up on fuel and swap left side tires. Buddy too is seen assisting with the tire change. Derek is now able to continue his war march. 460 miles later, 23 lead changes had taken place in attempts to keep Earnhardt out of the running. Seven cars, not counting the Days of Thunder camera cars, are no longer in the race. Rusty Wallace would overshoot his pit, but backs up to only take fuel to make the distance. Jeff Bodine's spoiler is knocked down upwards by Junior Johnson to help with downforce on his stop, both to contend with the track conditions being 85 degrees and an attempt to run down Dale Earnhardt. A third caution comes on at lap 193 and will shake things up in a major way. Apparently, the additional downforce did not help Jeff Bodine and actually helped him result in getting a spin. Flat spotted tires will mean four new ones for the number 11 machine. Earnhardt's advantage is now thrown out the window, as the field will now run up behind him on the restart. Left sides and a splash of fuel for the final shootout. It is now eight cars on a lead lap, and another savvy call from Buddy Parrott has Derek only taking fuel. The much older tires mean potentially less grip, but he is counting on track position to make up the deficit. He will have to hold off Dale as best as he can, and he will lead them on the restart. Under caution, during the shuffle to find their start positions, Bobby Hillen runs into the left rear side of the number three car. They are uncertain about how bad the damage actually is, but they will have no choice but to roll with it. 
Whilst Richard Childress fires off complaints to NASCAR Competition Tower, Harry Hyde will tell Bobby Hillen to just keep his foot in it for the time being. The green flag waves, and the race is underway. And the rest, as they say, is history. It's a great win for the Northwest. When you think of the years that they've had drivers come down here from the Northwest to race, this is the first time they have ever tasted a victory in the Daytona 500. Look again at what happened. Well, Earnhardt looked like he had things in command. All of a sudden, his Chevrolet just slows, and he goes up into the second groove. Something happened to that car. I guess the engine. I thought he had a tire go down, but I believe it was something else. He lost power. Cope took advantage of it. Here's Earnhardt coasting around. Cope comes on to win. Terry Labonte will come home with a second-place finish. Bill Elliott in third. Let's go to Dave Despain. Derek Cope still has a problem. He's on the radio to the crew chief, Buddy Parrott. What did he say? He don't know where Victor Lane is. <laughs> you believe it. Absolutely not. I'll tell you what, you know, in my wildest dreams, you know, you, you, you always come down here with optimism, but, you know, this is this is the one that eludes everybody, and Darrell Walter did it last year, you know, for the first time in his career, and it is a pleasure to have the Pure Letter Chevrolet aluminum up front and take the win like this. It's it's a dream come true. You played professional baseball. You came down here to race with virtually no money last year, and now you've won the biggest prize in all of this sport. Tell me about the pass for the lead. Well, you know, Earnhardt was dominant all day long. We, I, there was no way I was going to get him. I was just trying to hold off Terry Labonte, but he blew a tire going in the last turn. He did a heck of a job holding that car in line. I went to the bottom side and, and had the win. But uh, I'll tell you, Dale was a dominant car. But that pure letter Chevrolet Lumina is, is number one in, in victory lane. Eric, congratulations. Let's go to David Hobbs. Nobody could have anticipated this. Not Earnhardt, not Bob Whitcomb, not Teresa or Taylor Earnhardt, not even Derek. It was anticipated that it finished well, perhaps fifth, but not first. It was the first Cup Series win for the team, too, and it could not have been a bigger win. Derek Cope, at best until today, a backmarker, now forever will be a Daytona 500 champion. All the pieces fit. A veteran crew chief, formerly working with the likes of none other than Richard Petty, now helps a young upstart driver and a young upstart team get to high places. Nothing short of incredible. But where would they go from here? What they didn't know is that time was now against them. Bob Whitcomb now may have had a great combination, but still not enough money to sort out loose ends. The Hendrick Racing Engine deal was only for 21 races. He also couldn't afford to keep Buddy Parrott around forever either. They may have done the unthinkable, but now they were about to have to make a lot happen with very little in reserve. The results to follow to some may be expected. At the next week at Richmond, Mark Martin would begin his 19 night championship fight by nabbing the win, but Derek would be junked come lap 305. The fans already were beginning to call the Daytona 500 winner nothing but a sheer fluke. Or, at the very least, Bob Woodcomb only putting all his eggs into the super speedway basket. Kyle Petty would win the next race at Brockingham, and Derek at least mustered 12th, climbing up from 15th. The week after that, Dale would take Atlanta, and Derek would take a blown motor, with deja vu at Darlington the following weekend. At Bristol, Davey would win it, edging out Mark Martin. Derek, however, wouldn't even make it 56 laps before being junked altogether. As you can imagine, this was taking a huge toll on the team. It was already costing them a lot to operate, but it was now bleeding into what was already remaining in reserves. Something had to change for the better and fast. Derek would finish no better than 21st at North Wilkesboro, but at least there, and Martinsville the week after, he could keep it out of the fence. At Talladega, though, he wouldn't even manage more than three laps before the engine went from being internal combustion to external combustion. Same driver, the same car, which mustered 500 miles of endurance and a win, wouldn't even cover 100 miles. Ironically, in that year's Coca-Cola 600, not only did the engine not blow, but it held together enough to finish 9th. And, a week later, he got his chance to prove his naysayers wrong once again. It took them at least 10 races, but his point was made. Don't count me out just yet. It's a long season. Just you wait. The next race weekend took them to Sears Point. His first debut was actually not far from Sonoma, at California Riverside's Twisty S's. Despite the time interval, he showed that he could still hold his own here too, finishing 13th. Harry Gant would take the checker to the Tricky Triangle, but Derek would come home with a respective 12th, repeating his efforts the next week at Michigan. With the Cup Series return to Daytona in July for the Pepsi 400, his performance seemingly was the polar opposite of the Daytona 500. He would finish second to last. 
Derek would at least be able to mirror his finish at Pocono, however, once again grabbing 13th. With the return to Talladega, Derek and company hoped to run further than just three laps this time. Well, he did a lot more than that. 500 miles. And quick thinking during those 188 laps, would let him finish 7th. In the rolling green hills of Watkins Glen, Derek's engine would expire on lap 45. Derek would continue to lose pace in the following race weekends, finishing 19th, and in others, failing to once again finish at all. Darlington would lap him a top 10, but it wouldn't be enough to give the number 10 team the additional much needed shot in the arm. Engine failures would cause more DNFs, and when he was able to at least finish, it was often outside the top 10, with the 12th place finish at the season enter Atlanta. With the 1990 season over, a post-mortem was begun, and would be the beginning of some more drastic changes for the team. Buddy Parrott would be let go and replaced with Barry Dodson, himself a championship winning crew chief, having worked with Rusty Wallace in the number 27 car for the 1989 season. Purelater would agree to stay on for the 1991 season, but its parent company, Pennzoil, was looking to sell them off, instead opting to have them be an independent IPO. With financial uncertainty of their own, this would likely be the last time they could back the number 10 car, assuming they can even last the entire season. As low things might have gotten during the 1990 season, what was about to transpire could not have turned out to be any worse than imagined. Between the detractors and budget cuts, it was already off to a terrible start. He'd find his way to 11th at Atlanta, but engine trouble at Darlington ended any recovery effort. A crash at Bristol almost completely killed Bill Elliott's effort after Derek lost a right front tire. A finish outside the top 20 at North Wilkesboro only compounded problems, and he would fail to qualify for the Haynes 500 at Martinsville. He would attempt to make it into the Talladega race, qualifying 23rd, but he would blow a motor late in the race. Derek Cope attempted to make something out of that year's Coca-Cola 600, but would later only finish 12th. Worst attempt than that of even last year. Dover didn't go any better, crashing out late in the race. Derek would not even be a factor at Sonoma, starting and finishing 30th. Derek would somehow salvage a 10th place finish at the Tricky Triangle, only to falter next weekend at Michigan, with engine failure only two laps into the race. A return to a plate track would give him familiar ground, but only familiar enough to land him 17th. Pocono would not be kind to him later in the season either, with a crash on lap 29. Rusty Wallace would go on to win the rain-shortened event. With this being over halfway in the season, any hopes of being a championship contender was now gone, and the number 10 team desperately clinged on for dear life. Another engine failure due to a busted oil pan would take him out the running of the Die Hard 500 at Talladega. Derek would finish 12th at the Glen, followed by another engine failure in Michigan, and yet another at Bristol. He'd manage to cling on for a 16th spot at Richmond, with a crash out on lap 67 at Dover. The series would return to Martinsville, and this time Derek would actually qualify for the field, starting 23rd and finishing 19th. At least here he kept his fender and engine intact this time. For the rest of the season, Derek would never again see the inside of the top 10, instead seeing either oil or the outside wall. When average finish at 24th, all Derek could show for his effort was 28th in points. So far his absolute worst full-time season result a polar opposite to his 1990 effort. 1992 would not go much better, only managed to string together three top tens. A consequence of the calamities, Bob Whitcomb would have no choice but to shut down the team altogether. As for the onlookers, the detractors saw this as proof positive that he was indeed a fluke, and that only managed to get lucky twice. With no number 10 car to hop into anymore, it was time to look elsewhere. For 1993, the Daytona 500 champ would go on to race for a four-time Daytona 500 champ, Cale Yarborough. He would replace Dick Trickle, and would start off the season in an unsponsored number 66 for Thunderbird. But the team would soon be backed by Bojangles starting at the Richmond race. With that, a number changed from number 66 to 98. This time around, he'd at least peer into the top 20, though oftentimes a few laps down. For the first seven races of the season, Derek experienced something that he hadn't in his cup career until that point. Consistency. Was he in contention to win? Not really. But finishing strong mattered more in the big picture than being in the top five for a handful of laps and then blowing or crashing outright. And thus finishing nowhere near the top 30. Derek finally managed a top 10 at Talladega with a very respectable 8th. 
However, at the Coca-Cola 600, Derek would lose a motor on lap 182, and he would crash it at Dover the following weekend. A burnt-out clutch killed any momentum at Pocono after that. The rest of the season would go mostly unremarkably, though, with the only incident being a very occasional part failure. He'd finish 26th in points by season's end, having only led 38 laps in all. That's 38 more laps, however, than 1991 and 1992 combined. Derek would then find a seat with Bobby Allison's number 12 Ford Thunderbird, taking the seat from Jimmy Spencer. Much as was the case with Bob Whitcomb's operation, Bobby was hurting for money, as was Kale, though to a lesser extent. Still, it was better than nothing. Despite the midfield team budget, he'd already get a top 10 in the second race of the season. He'd improve that with a 6th place finish at Richmond. His first top 5 of the season would come at Darlington. North Wilkesboro would be especially punishing that year. Heat fatigue affecting the field, taking out Kyle Petty and Greg Sachs. Derek would survive and take 30th. Derek would crash out lap 64 at Talladega, but a 12th place finish at Sonoma would offset the incident somewhat. A 7th place finish at Loudoun would show an incredible promise for a late season comeback, especially given they started 23rd, but that would be immediately derailed by an engine failure going back to Pocono. A string of other engine failures and lackluster finishes, Derek would finish 10th at Bristol with another top 10 at Dover instead of an engine problem or a wreck. Another at Martinsville, and his best finish would come at Phoenix, just barely being edged out by Ricky Rudd. He'd be the closest he'd ever come to winning again. The most ironic part was he was beaten by the number 10 car. His overall efforts would be not in vain, though, finishing 15th overall in points. This would be the best he would ever finish in the Cup Series. Starting in 1996, whatever remained of forward career momentum had begun to fizzle out. He'd managed three top tens, but threw and through a very lockbuster season. 1997 would see Cope fill the seat of the number 36 Skittles Pontiac for MB2 Motorsports. Things would not go well. Poor finishes, a failure to qualify Atlanta, set things back in a big way. However, a Hail Mary run from 42nd to 8th at Michigan showed that, at least if nothing else, he really did have a big heart and a will to win. His best finish would be 5th at the season ending race at Atlanta, but it was far too little, far too late. He'd finished 27th in points. 1998 would see him jump yet again to another ride, this time to Bahari Racing, driving the number 30 Gumout Pontiac. It would show an inverse of previous season runs. Derek would tend to qualify well, but would fall back fast, without seemingly any ability to gain or even defend positions. But even this would have hiccups, with him failing to qualify for the race at Texas Motor Speedway. Jeff Green would temporarily take the seat from Derek in the Martinsville race, but would be back in the saddle come Talladega. Derek would fail to qualify for yet another race, this time at Michigan, and would fail to qualify for the Brickyard and later at New Hampshire. At Dover, he would actually manage to qualify very well, starting third. However, the engine it had other ideas, expiring on lap 314 and thus killing any other chance of having a repeat win at Dover. Despite how dreadful the season had been so far, he would manage his first ever career pole position at Charlotte. He wouldn't go flag to flag, however, only finishing 14th. In all, he'd finish out at 37th at points and it would be the last time he would drive full-time for any race team in the Cup Series. Going from bad to worse, Derek failed to qualify not once, not twice, but ten times in 1999. Unsurprisingly, he was let go from Bahari, and would briefly race here and there for other teams even further back in the field. In 2001, Derek made a surprise announcement that he would own and operate his own race team, Derek Cope Racing. The team had, however, failed to qualify for any race the entire year. Come 2003, Tom Arnold of Arnold Motorsports, a famously field filler operation, offered to merge teams. Derek Cope's Daytona champion status allowed for provisional starts. 2004 would see that the deal would go through, merging the number 79 and 37 teams, resulting in the number 50 Dodge. At that year's Dodge Dealers 400 at Darlington, Derek still showed that he had some life left in him. I got some more looking to do. We got to do some more checking out. I'm with you. Tell you what, I believe Derek Cope's on a pretty good run right here. Let's see where he's going to be. He's on the pole, guys. 28, 77. But he practiced good. He practiced good. What about that? 
Bring it in, Derek. Bring it in now. Yes, sir. Holy cow. Actually, uh, the car was pretty good. It really wasn't a, it wasn't a hold your breath lap. The car was good and solid, you know, and uh, you know, I took a chance down there and uh, matted it and the thing stuck. And just a tribute to Mike Hillman and Don Arnold and everybody giving me the opportunity to run this car. And uh, tell you what, my gig engines, uh, it's nice to drive really good equipment. It wouldn't result in starting on pole, but a fifth place starting spot is nothing to sniff at, even on a higher end car, but especially more so given the state of the team and equipment. The team and the operation would part teams after the Coke 600, however. 2008 would see Derek's team attempt to rejoin the Cup Series, but he'd fail in both his Cup Series restart attempts. They would also attempt to run in the Bush Series, now called the Nationwide Series. In 2010, Derek's nieces Angela and Amber Cope would also be given opportunities to run the Truck Series under his operation. Speaking of the Truck and Bush Series, you may have noticed I haven't really mentioned either series much in relation to Derek here. Is it because he completely skipped both series? Well, no, actually. It may not have started in Bush, but he did actually eventually get a start in 1990, the same year of all his winning efforts. Seems a bit strange on its own, but he would never be a blip on the Bush radar until much later. And the case of the truck series even more so. He'd be one of the first drivers to kick off the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series starting in 95, and would continue to race as late as 2008. But throughout that entire time, he only managed just one top 10. In the Bush series, he'd managed one win at New Hampshire in 1994, eight top 10s across that entire series. But this is not what people remember. What people recall more than anything else, of all things, is this. It's got a flat right front tire and the hood's off this car. It's obviously had some sort of issue. Hood not off, and this is, he's missing the bus stop. Oh my goodness. And I suppose that's the most unfortunate part about all of this. Fans of the sport for decades will know exactly who Derek is, but those in recent years, granted myself included, only knew this much about him. Surprisingly, you'd have to dig a bit to even know he was in contention to win the Daytona 500, let alone become champion. A freak tire explosion is more associated with him than his win in the Great American Race. His scuffles with modern era Cup Series drivers are better remembered than even his own Cup Series efforts. It's for this, and many other reasons besides, that he is forever a curiosity in the sport's history. As for Derek's side in this, he still adores the sport. Unfortunately, his last attempt at running a team, or even participating in the sport, was in 2021 with Starcom. If you still feel he's a fluke at the end of all this, that's your prerogative. If you think he was the most underrated, there's a case to be made there too. There's one thing that is for certain, however. Say what you will, but he will forever and always be a Daytona 500 champion.